Talk really loud. You're on. <laughs> My mouth's dry enough as it is. I'm yelling. Um, the words in Silent Night, love's pure light. Uh, I've spent the past two weeks preparing for this. And, uh, I have, the first week was, I, I was really taking the time to pray and to say, God, what do you want me to bring to the people here? What message do you want them to hear? It is not my message. It is not my words. Lord, it is yours. I'm just a vessel. I'm just the voice to bring to bring your word here. And I read and I read and I read. And God spoke to me through one little passage, and it's like this is it. This is it right here. This morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter five, verses thirteen through sixteen. This chapter five contains uh, a passage that should be may be familiar to many of us here is the Beatitudes. But it's what comes after the Beatitudes. And if, you, if you're not sure what that is, the Beatitudes were Jesus is teaching on the mountainside. He says, blessed are those that are the peacekeepers. Blessed are those that are pure in heart. But it's the passage that come after that stood out to me. And before we get there, I want to tell you, before we get there, I want to tell you a story about a little girl. She was driving home home with her parents. She wasn't driving, of course, a little girl. But she was she was riding in a car, in a car with her parents after church one Sunday. And she had a confused look on her face. She was like, Mom, I got a question for you. And uh, she said, Mommy, there's something about the preacher's message this morning that I don't understand. Mother said, oh, what is it? The little girl replied, well, he said God is bigger than we are. He said God is so big that he could hold the whole world in his hands. Is that true? The mother replied, yes, that's true, honey. The girl had to be confused. You know, God's that big to hold the whole world. Thought was trying to understand, okay, well, God's that big. You know, how does he get you know, down here with us? And she says, Mommy, he also said God comes to live inside of us when we believe in Jesus as our Savior. Is that true too? Again, the mother assured the little girl that what the pastor said was true. The girl was puzzled. She said, if God is bigger than us, if he lives on us, wouldn't he show through? Wouldn't he show through? God is so big that he showed through. And that was it was that that story that gave me the title here. God shines through. God is so big, wouldn't He show through in our lives? The text says in Matthew, if you want to turn there, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, it says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we join together in worship, as we join together as one united body, the body of Christ this morning, Father, I pray that, pray that you would just pour your spirit out upon us here. Let your spirit flow through each and every heart here. Let our minds and our ears be open. Let our hearts be open to hear a word from you. Because this book, your word, is our instruction manual. As we learned in Sunday school this morning, it is our, it is our, it is the book we live by every day. Let us seek it in your word every day. And how we should pray, and how we should live. We thank you for being able to worship with you, to worship you, to love you, and to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Like I said, this passage is uh, this, this passage comes after the Beatitudes. Jesus has uh, he, he saw a great multitude of people that were following him, and he went up on the mountainside. 
to teach. And he taught the attitudes and he uh, drew the disciples close close around and you know and he gave them these words. You are the salt of the earth. You are a city on a hill. You are a light to this world. <coughs> and like the little girl pointed out, if God is bigger, God is bigger than the whole world. Wouldn't he shine through? Now I didn't use the word show, I used the word shine because that you know, the like the verse in, in some you know God's radiance, his love, you just can't you can't help but shine through in your life. You can't help but radiate from a believer, from a person who has had a real experience with Christ. In verse 13 it says, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but as salt shall lose its taste. Now shall that saltiness be restored. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out of trample when the people speak. You are the salt of the earth. Now, in preparing for this, I have learned a lot about salt. Probably more than I ever anticipated. Uh, there were a few things that I found really interesting. Salt was actually valued very highly in the first century. It was The Roman soldiers were actually paid a portion of their, their pay in salt. It had that much value. Uh, salt, it, and like it's used today, uh, the salt is also an antiseptic. It is a purifier. You, know, you see that in some, you may like charcoal, you'll see salt in some water purification systems. Uh, um, it, it, it cleans. You can use salt to clean dirty water to make it drinkable. It's a purifier. Salt is also a necessity for life. We cannot function as people naturally without salt in our bodies. Now, think about that. Salt is a necessity of life. What is salt, though? Now, here's an interesting fact for you. Salt is actually a combination of two elements. It's a combination of sodium and chlorine. Salt is, is an extremely, extremely active element. It seeks to bind with something. This is what I was talking about, the stuff that I learned this week in preparing for this. This, this whole thing just really, God said, this is, this is who I am. See how I relate in the natural world? It's, it's a mirror. Sodium is an active element that seeks to bind with something, and it will bind with chlorine, which chlorine is a poisonous gas, which can do harm. It can hurt you. If you've ever gotten bleach in your eyes, you know, swimming, you know, or chlorine bleach, you know, in your eyes, it stuff burns. But uh, it sodium will bind with that chlorine to make salt. Now, how amazing is that? That sodium will bind with something dangerous to make it something that can be used to preserve, can be used to purify, can be used to make something taste better. They can be used to help in in instances where uh, you, when it's frozen out, you know, you see people put, you know, cities will put salt on bridges and, and stairs, you know, and it, it, it gives good footing. It makes the ice melt, and, and so you can have something you could stand on without slipping and embarrassing yourself. <laughs> Doesn't that? Me too. You don't want to see me fall. It's uh, better hold on to something. <laughs> but salt, though, is that combination. What stood out to me is Jesus comes into our life. He takes the bad parts of us and he purifies that. He binds with us and makes us new. He makes us a new creation. We're no longer poisonous. We're no longer sinful. We're no longer bad. We are clean. We are forgiven. He gives us life gives us value. Same thing as salt. It gives us value. If salt was valuable to the Romans in that time period, we are valuable to God. It gives us life. Salt is a necessity of life. Jesus comes in and he gives us life. We cannot have life apart from Jesus. We are dead in our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are changed. You are new. Just like the sodium going, combining with chlorine to make something new, Jesus comes into our lives and into our hearts, and he makes us new. He gives us life. 
He makes us valuable. The old is gone. The old has passed away. That sinful, that bad, that poisonous part of our life that separated us from God is no longer there. Jesus is necessary for this change. He's absolutely necessary because without him there is no purifier. There is no new life. Now, second thing it says, uh, in verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I want to look at that, that last part of verse 14. You are a city set on a hill. Just like the salt, you're the salt of the earth. Jesus has come in and made you a new creation. He has purified you. And his forgiveness and his love shines through you in that new creation. You are now a city on a hill. You are now in a place where you should not be hidden. You are alive. You are forgiven. You have value higher than you can ever imagine because God has poured his love, he has poured his forgiveness, he has poured his life out for you. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. In Judea, or Israel, in parts of Israel, cities, some cities were built on hills. And possibly at this time when Jesus was teaching the, the multitude and the disciples, he, he could have very easily, he was positioned on this mountainside, he could very easily see another city positioned on another hill, off in the distance. And maybe that's what, kind of what triggered you know, him pointing this out, because that city could not be hidden. And there are a couple of reasons why, you know, these people that built these cities built them on a hill. Is, uh, it gives us a, a strategic, uh, it gives a strategic advantage. They're attacked. Most cities in the first century were built with walls around them. Um, so if you if you're positioned on a hill, not only do you have the walls to secure you, but you have a vantage point that gives you an advantage over any enemies or or anyone trying to um, come into your city to take it over. Um, so this was common. But you could see these cities. You could see them around. You couldn't help but see them. They're on a hill. How do you miss that? They can be clearly seen. But also think about that a city on a hill can give hope. A city on a hill can give hope to a weary traveler. Imagine you're wandering lost in a desert. And you're, you, you don't know where you are. You don't know what you're going to do. You have no food, no water. Possibly the thoughts that you're going to face certain death. And you, you, of course, you know, when you're faced with death, you're automatically going to think, what have I done with my life? Where have I spent it? Was it valued that because I worked seven days a week? 12, 14 hours a day and I didn't spend time with my family? Was it valued because you know I didn't take my kids to church and teach them the precepts of God so that their eternal life was would be secure, that they would have an opportunity? It's not going to be on the fact that you didn't have the newest car. It's not going to be on the fact that you had a lot of money. It's not going to, none of that's going to matter at this point. What's going to matter is what did you do with your life? What did you leave behind? And where are you going to go when your time comes? It's a, it, it would be a very sobering reality to be stuck in a position like that. You think the end is here. But then all of a sudden, as you're wandering, as you're struggling to make it, you see in the distance, there it is, refuge. There it is, hope. There's a city on a hill. Then you feel bolstered, you feel energized. I can make it there. I can make it to that city. If I can make it there, I will find shade. I will find water. I will find food. And I will find rest. That is what you all offer as believers. And shining your faith in God working through you and shining through you and showing through you in your life after you've been purified, after you've been forgiven, as you're a city on a hill, you may offer refuge for someone. You may offer refuge for a weary traveler 
a sinner looking for hope, someone lost, someone depressed, someone down, someone hurting, you may be that sin on a hill for them. You may be the only opportunity that they get to hear Jesus. I think that's why he said, you are a sin on a hill. Because God shining through you, God radiating through you, you can't help but see it. See, the hill was clearly seen. can be seen from, for miles. That is what we are. We are a beacon of hope. We are a city of refuge. We offer the gospel of Jesus Christ for those weary travelers. And the question is, is your life standing tall to where in what the Lord has done for you in offering that refuge? John 4.14 4, says, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, rolling up to eternal life. As a city on a hill, when you're offering refuge for that lost traveler, that's, that's what you're offering. You're offering water. You know, if anybody's been out a hot day long enough, you know how thirsty you get. I'm going to be honest. I'm up here, up here right now. These lights are on me. I'm thirsty bad, <laughs> but that is that you're offering that water, you're offering eternal water. That thirst for something more is what you, your life is to shine through. God working through you and people see that eternal work, that change, that transformation, that new creation that is your life. They see that. They see that shining through and they think, I'm I want that. I am thirsty for something like that. Why can't I have that? You're there, shining clearly. You can have this. It's a free gift. God is offering you. Verse 14. Verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When God shines through, you are the light of the world. So we've seen you are a salt of the earth. You have been purified. You have been cleansed. You have been made a new creation. And with that, you are now a city on a hill. can be seen We've seen for miles around God's radiance, His work, His new life that He's given you, being seen all around you. You're also the light of the world. When God's when God shines through you, you are the light of the world. It says there, a lamp. Now, I looked up what a lamp was in the first century. I gotta love Google. Uh, it definitely helped me through this. Um, but it was it was. There was a couple of them, but the one I thought was, this one I thought was cute. I think it was a little, like a little piece of pottery, and, uh, it's like bowl shaped, and uh, I wish I'd put a picture of it in there, but it was, it had, on one end, it was kind of, kind of it looked like kind of like a teapot, a little, so it had a wick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she loves me. <laughs> um, it looked like a little teapot, it had a little, kind of like a spout on it where they'd stick the wick and then they would fill it with oil. That lamp could not work without that oil. Other than that, it's just oil. Oh, you know. Yeah, the wick's laying in it. It's stuck in there, it's filled with oil, and you light the wick and it burns through. But the, it doesn't work without the oil. It is not going to burn without the oil. You cannot have light in that house with that lamp without being filled with oil. You are the light of the world. That light will not work without being filled with the Spirit. Without Jesus filling you with His light. He said, I've come to give life and I've come to give it more abundantly. He's come to give you that oil to light up your life. Not only does that lamp light up your life, but as it says, you put a lamp on the lampstand to bring 
more light. Like a city on a hill can be clearly seen. That lamp is placed on a lampstand to put out more light. So it can spread to everyone else. It says you don't put it under a put it under a basket. You don't cover up the light. You don't cover up the work that God has done in you. You don't hide the fact that God has renewed you, that he has taken the old and he has taken the sinful and he has forgiven you and he has washed you clean and you don't hide that. God has done an amazing work in every person's life that has followed him. I think back to, to the stories you know, in, in, the, in the Gospels and Think of all the people that has had an experience with him. Uh, you, you think about the the people he's healed, the leper. You know, the leper, he healed him. His life was never the same again. He went from a life of being sick, being an outcast, to being able to be accepted back in the community, not having to worry about being shunned or pushed aside because he was this, this gross, sick thing that nobody wants to touch. His life was never the same. I think about the woman that, that had the issue. She just wanted to touch the hem of his robe. That real encounter, that real encounter changed her life. <coughs> Lazarus, being brought back from the dead, Lazarus died before Jesus had his work done before the cross happened, and to be brought back, and then to be able to experience the work that Jesus did on the cross, to be able to have the opportunity to accept the light of the world and the forgiveness that is in that, to have an opportunity to have that relationship with God restored, that's his life never been the same. He was taken from he was taken from death at a time when that relationship was not restored to life, and then he was able to experience that with Jesus, and then to have life more abundantly, to have life here and then in the hereafter. So a lot of a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Your lamp should should shine so bright in this world that people can't help but see that God has changed you, that God has worked in you. It shines through every part of your life. It shines through how you talk. It shines through, uh, it shines through your, your witness. Now, I'm not talking about you going out and you saying, you know, walking up to somebody, do you know Jesus? Uh, you want to start a, a kind of conversation off. A lot of times in a defensive mode, you say, do you know Jesus? And I'm going to be like, hold up, bro, I'm in church. Are you gonna? But it's, it's your actions. It's how you talk to people every day, how you interact with them. Are you negative all the time? Are you, are you sad all the time? You know, what do people see when they see you? Do they see the light? Do they see God's radiance shining through you? Or do they see somebody that is just negative, that talks bad about people all the time? Do they see somebody who is, is can't seem to quite you know, get their, their stuff together? And, and you know you know when they see, you see people like that and you think, God, they just need you. They need you. They need that relationship with you to get right. Michael shared this morning in Sunday school, he said, this book holds the antidote everything. This is our cure. The, the gospel, the, the gift that this book tells us about, it, it is our answer to everything. And we should be willing to let our light shine like a lamp on a lampstand, to light up as far a reach as our life can give. It also shines through our relationships. I've shared this before. Uh, where I work now, I've been there Two years in February, and I've struggled with my coworker. He's um, he's an interesting fella, uh, very hyper, very energetic. Everything's a four alarm fire. I'm a little more laid back. I tend to process things a little more logically. You know, he's 
a go getter. I'm a hold on, let's think about this. You know? And uh, we we should we should really kind of uh, we we should work together well because one person does one thing better, you know. And we should work like I guess gears and machines is how we should work. And for the past two years, I've struggled with that because I'm like, you know, dude, slow down. You know, this is too much. You know, you're going to get in trouble. You, you, you jump into this, you know. And I struggled with the negative feelings that I had toward him because of his personality, because of who he was. And that did not shine the light of Christ because I was quick to point out, you know, it really gets on the nerve. I mean, that's just all it was to it. He really tested my patience. And I didn't ask God for more patience. I've got the patience of Job. I can, uh, my wife and I, we'll, I'll stand in the line for hours. You know, it don't make a difference to me. I've got nowhere else to go. But she's like, oh, they're tapping their foot. Oh, wish they'd hurry up. And what are they doing up there? And I'm just like, I'm just looking at the things around me. You know, where else are we going? But I just didn't have that patience with him. And it was that relationship that people saw the negative side of me. The problem was not with him. The problem was with me. And I had to address that. And God was quick enough. He was quick enough to point that out to me recently. I made a comment in a meeting to someone about my coworker, And that conviction hit me like that. And I felt like dirt the rest of the day. God's light did not shine through at all in that, in that relationship. I should have been patient. I should have been loving. I should have been everything that Christ taught me to be. His light also shines through your finances. What do you do with your money? Are you throwing it away, buying frivolous things? Are you throwing it at a, you know, buying lottery tickets? Or, you know, or what are you doing with your money? Are you taking your money that God has given you, giving back to Him what He has commanded, and then it, and spending it wisely? That is a serious part of our life that we don't think falls under God's plan. But that right there is the way that God's light shines through, whether we want to face it or not. Every aspect of our life is tied to our relationship with Him. Because we are new. We're a new creature. We are not the old. We're not the old sinful person. We are new. We have been changed. We have been brought from death to life. We are now a light. And it's not our light that shines. The Greek word for light, I thought this was interesting, is, is, is phos. It's P-H-O-S, phos. And it does not, it, it, it means, one of the definitions is source of light. Now, I sat there and I looked at that, source of light. So, to me, it is not my light that I am emanating. It is the light of Christ. I am the lamp, but it is His oil, it is Him that is shining through me. Philippians 2, 14-15 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine, as lights in the world. Look at that. You are in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Don't that describe where we are now? <clears throat> We've been like this for a long time, but it seems to be getting worse. I see society just crumbling all around us. From marriage, divorce, I see children being just thrown aside, kids <coughs> being trapped in... in in pornography, because it's so easily accessed now. This is a twisted and crooked world, and it needs a light. It needs someone to offer that salt, that purifying element, so they can have new life. They need a city on a hill that people can go out and they can see believers. They can see them. They can see, oh, that's my refuge over there. That's my hope. I'm here thirsty. I'm here on the brink of death. And there, there's my hope. There's where I can get water. There is where I can have life. It's a dark and cruel world. 
We're to be a light in it. We are to light up not only our our space, but every space we enter. It is more than just our home. It is more than just our church. It is stepping out this door. It is going into work. It is going into school. It is going into a friend's house, a place we eat. That is where our light should shine. That light should never be put under a basket. It should never be distinguished just because we step somewhere else. It should shine no matter what. If you're a new creation, when you accept the work, the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you accept the fact that he was nailed, crucified, died, buried, and resurrected without the power of the resurrection there would be no life how are we to be resurrected if Jesus hadn't been resurrected that's life there's life in that we have hope because he was resurrected he conquered it he conquered sin he conquered death we don't have to do anything but put our faith in him accept him touch the hem of his robe just know that Jesus if I can just touch you, if I can just have one experience with you, come into my life, it will change me forever. And then I can let my light shine. Because that source of that light is you. What a greater gift now at Christmas. What a greater gift we can have. We go out and we spend money on, on gifts for our kids, and our parents, and our, and our loved ones, our friends. We may spend $5, we may spend $500, but none of it, none of, none of it is as valuable as the gift of Jesus because it gives us something we can't buy. It gives us hope. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us life, eternal life. It is not just, it is not just a life here on earth. It goes beyond here. It goes to eternity. That's a long time. It's hard to wrap our minds around that. It's hard to wrap our minds around eternity because we are trapped in, in finite thinking. God is infinite. He's not bound by anything. And that's what he's offering us, a life in that. Do you, and I want to ask this question this morning, do you have that life? Do you have that new life? You can be the salt of the earth. You can be the city on a hill. And you can be the light of this world. But it all starts with Jesus. It all starts with forgiveness. It all starts with a relationship with Him. It all starts in that manger that we are about to celebrate. The birth of our Savior. I'm going to ask Brother Brett to come up here in a moment. We're going to have a moment of invitation. I ask you this morning, look at your life, look at your heart. Are you the light of the world? If not, look at the fact, have you accepted Christ? Have you accepted the gift that is freely given? Look at your life. Is Jesus there? Is he filling your lamp? Is he the oil in your lamp that's allowing you to radiate his presence, to be able to touch other people, to show the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring hope, to bring refuge, to bring life, to bring life, to bring forgiveness, to bring a new creation, to do the one thing that nobody else in this room can do, that nobody out there in that world can do, that can make your life different, that can change your life forever. I'm going to be down front. If you, if you want to know that, if you want to see, if you want to know more about what this Jesus is, who he is and what he did for you, I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be glad to talk with you. If you just want somebody to pray with you about something, I'll be glad to do that. If you want to just come and kneel here at the altar, you can do that. If you want to pray in your chair, you can do that. I just ask that you seek Jesus. Make sure that he is the one that is making you the salt of the earth, the city on a hill, and the light of this world. Make sure that he has changed your life for the better. It is taken away and washed away all that, all that bad stuff, all that sin. And he's giving you hope. He's giving you love. He's giving you eternal life. I'm going to ask everybody to stand.